Noel did, we certainly do need to remember in prayer those folks in Ukraine who are going through a very difficult time right now. And we do have many Christian brothers and sisters there, and, and we have heard that some of them have lost their homes. Many are hiding in subways and other places trying to survive. Our brother-in-law, Jeff Abrams, as I've mentioned before, has been going over to Ukraine a couple of times a year for many, many years now. And he was just over there recently and pretty much got out just in time. He says, as far as he knows right now, uh, all of those folks that we know or have connections to are still safe at this time, but we certainly do need to keep them in our prayers. A lot of people are already sending money over there to help our brethren. If you would like to do that, you could give it to me or to Sandy. We will pass it on to Jeff, and he will make sure it gets over there. If you would like to write a check, you can make it out to the Tuscumbia Church of Christ, and we'll send it there, and Jeff will take all that, combine it with other gifts, and wire that money over there. As I said, we certainly do need to keep those folks in our prayers. You've probably heard the statement that is often attributed to Mark Twain. Supposedly, he once said, the rumors of my death have been greatly exaggerated. I kind of felt that way these last couple of weeks. It actually wasn't really all that bad. It just took me longer than I thought it would to at least get some better. And as Kevin said, I'm not 100% yet, but I haven't been 100% in many years. So anyway, thank you so much for many of you who checked on me, and certainly thank you so much for your prayers. And I truly am thankful to be back with you today. I really miss being able to be with my church family. So glad we can be together today. Something I thought about these last couple of weeks, and I'm kind of guessing most folks, when they get COVID, at least at some point, it crosses their mind that there have been a lot of people who have not survived COVID. And in fact, as you know, we have lost some special, much-loved people to COVID, to other issues as well over the past couple of years, even over the past few weeks. I know that many of you have suffered heartache and grief in times past, maybe long ago, maybe recent, maybe you are dealing with grief even right now, and you may be doing so for a while. We've all been there, and I'm quite sure that all of us, if we're not now, will once again be dealing with such things. Unfortunately, it's it's one of those sad things in life. We have to deal with these things from time to time. And today I want to share something with you that I hope will help, not only to help those who may be grieving, but also to help all the rest of us as well. Uh, as we want somehow to be able to help those who are grieving. And I'm hopeful some of the things I'll share with you today might help you with that as well. Someone once said, grief is not a disorder. It's not a disease or a sign of weakness. It is an emotional, physical, and spiritual necessity. It's the price that you pay for love. And the only cure for grief is to grieve. And again, most of us know what grief is, not just the definition of it, but we know what grief is because we have lived it and experienced it. 
If you get my emails on Friday, this last one would have mentioned that I was going to preach about overcoming grief and that I'm going to share with you this morning a story of tragedy and grief from my own family, and I hope this will be a blessing to you. This is Dale and Rita Brown. You probably don't know them, but if you lived in Central Texas, then you would have probably heard of them. Long ago, they were missionaries over in Brazil. Then they returned to the Midland, Texas area. Dale worked as an accountant for a while, and then he got into the oil and gas business, and he did very, very well. And he has become since then the president of many large companies. He's currently serving on the Board of Regents for Pepperdine University in Malibu, California. He has served on the Abilene Christian University Board for many, many years as well. Also, he has served on the Board of Trustees for the Christian Chronicle. Dale is also currently serving on many other boards of both for-profit and not-profit entities. Dale and Rita are long-term members of the Golf Course Road Church of Christ in Midland, Texas. Dale served as one of the elders there for many, many years. Rita, who I guess is around 70 years old, as you can see, is still a very beautiful woman. She always was, and I remember that well from when I was just a kid. Because you see, Rita is my dad's sister. She is my aunt, which makes Dale my very rich uncle. You really need to spend more time with those folks. So why do I share all this with you? Because Dale and Rita know about grief. Just because you might be very fortunate in some of the circumstances of your life doesn't mean that you are immune from some of the great tragedies that happen in life. And their greatest tragedy occurred a few years back at the end of the Memorial Day weekend. They have a great big cabin on a lake there nearby and a Quite often, and certainly every Memorial Day, all the big extended family will go there and enjoy that weekend together. On their way home that particular time from that wonderful holiday weekend, tragedy struck. This is one of their sons, my cousin Todd and his family. Todd serves as one of the ministers there at that church in Midland. These are the words that he spoke when he got up to preach for the first time since that devastating weekend. He said, most of you understand the significance of this sermon. For those of you who don't, I need to explain. On May 28th, Barely less than seven weeks ago, my family was in a terrible car wreck. Just outside of Robert Lee, our suburban rolled several times in seconds. Our lives were shattered. My beautiful 13-year-old son, Connor, was instantly killed. My 18-year-old daughter, Bailey, was badly injured. My wife, Leanne, my son, Hutton, my niece, Allison, and I basically walked away with only scratches. It has been the most horrible experience of our lives. This morning, he said, I want to talk to you about our journey into the valley of the shadow of death. Looking at that picture, Bailey is the girl in the back next to her mother, Connor is the boy there in the middle, and the tall boy next to him is his brother, the one who was driving that vehicle that day. 
And I first heard about this just a couple of months after it happened. One of my other aunts told me about it. And I went online to learn more and I found some of those grieving sites where people will write messages trying to help and the family as well will write messages there. And I remember well spending about two hours reading through that and crying terribly through it. Because doing so gave me at least a glimpse into the terrible grief that they were dealing with. I also found that sermon that Todd preached that day. And I still remember it well. And in that sermon, he talked about Job. And I invite you to be turning there to the book of Job in your Bible this morning. Today, I want to share with you some of what my cousin Todd said that day about the grief that he and his family were experiencing, much like the grief that Job also experienced. And again, I hope that his words might be a blessing to you this morning. We look first of all in Job chapter 1. We read that Job was truly a good man. Look here, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. His possessions also were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. And that man was the greatest of all the men of the East. And his sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day. And they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And it came about when the days of feasting had completed their cycle that Job would send and consecrate them, rising up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Todd said, Job loved God in the sunshine. The book starts out describing a man whose life is filled with sunshine. Job was a good man. He loved God and honored him with his whole life. Job was rich. He had a large and beautiful family that he loved and tried to protect. He was admired and respected. Job's life was a walk with God in the sunshine. Life was good. There must have been occasional shadows, but for the most part, Job had the life we all want. There was nothing wrong with that. It was a life blessed by God. He knew it came from God. He was thankful for it, and God was pleased with him. God loved Job. God loved Job when the story begins, and God loved Job when the story ends. And there is never a point when God stopped loving Job. The next thing he says is one of the most perplexing in Scripture. Heaven and hell are gathered before God. And God says, have you seen my servant Job? Satan responds that Job only loves God because he gets everything he wants. God gives permission for all that is about to happen to Job. In a matter of minutes, Job's life is shattered, blown into a million pieces that he could never put back together. He loses all his wealth and all his family. Job now has to deal with life in the valley of shadows. He isn't in the sunshine anymore. He is in darkness. And the most important part of this story is how he responds to God. Look down here in Job 1, starting in verse 20. After Job hears about the loss of everything, it says, Then Job arose 
and tore his robe and shaved his head and he fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Verse 22 says, Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. When the story gets even worse, look on down into chapter 2. Job chapter 2, starting in verse 7. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a pot shirt or pot shirt, a piece of pottery to scrape himself while he was sitting among the ashes. Verse 9, his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But Job said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. So how does Job respond to all these terrible circumstances? Number one, Job blames God. Todd says, I know this sounds like a contradiction to what the Bible said back in chapter 1 and verse 22, as it is in my New American Standard Bible. But he points out this is one of those times when Maybe other translations are better. The King James Version says, In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Another translation says, Job did not charge God with wrongdoing. In other words, he's not blaming God for doing something wrong, but he is holding God responsible for what happened. In his sermon, Todd said, Job says God gave and God took away. Job lays responsibility for the events of his life at the feet of God. Satan may have been involved, but he was a bit player in this drama. Job goes straight to God, and from that point on, Job's case is with God and no one else. Job uses strong words for a strong God. There are other ways to say it. God allowed it, or God will work good from it. But he said, my study for the past 20 years led me to believe that the most biblical way to describe life is to say God did it. I don't like it. I don't agree with it. I don't understand it, and I would never, ever have chosen it. But my case is with God and God alone. Again, the verse says, in all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Job got it right. He didn't blame God for something he shouldn't have done he acknowledged God was always ruling over Job's life. Number two, and I think it's important, yes, he holds God responsible, but Job also honors God. He said, blessed be the name of the Lord. Some will blame God without holding on to the truth that God is good and his ways are beyond our feeble minds. I know God is powerful, but I also know that God is good. I know that God is for us. I know that he can see more than we can. Todd said, I can't see past lunch. Much less beyond that ugly scar in the ground that holds the body of my son. But I believe that God can. It is hard. My heart 
hurts. But I have to trust that he knows what he is doing. He said there are two verses that speak powerfully to me. Look over at Job 13, verse 15. Job 13, 15 says, Though he slay me, Job talking about God, Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. And I think this was a turning point for Job. His faith is holding on. And then look at Job 19, verse 25 through 27. Job 19, 25 through 27. He said, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. If you are suffering grief and sorrow right now, you too may be asking, why is all this happening to me? But please know it will turn out right in the end. Our Redeemer lives. And he will stand victorious in the end. Number three, Job's friends come. They love Job. They see he is suffering terribly and they want somehow to help. And so they came and they wept for him. And they tore their clothes in sadness. And they sat with him for seven days and seven nights. This was a beautiful expression of love. At first, they got it right. But then his friends felt the need to help Job understand why these things had happened to him. And for the next 34 chapters, one of them will speak and Job will answer. And then the next one will speak and Job will answer. Three friends, three rounds each. Bottom line, they want to help Job by explaining God in very simple terms. Bad things happen because you are bad. If you do good, bad things won't happen. Some of what they say is true, but it is insensitive and wrongly applied. They reason that because something terrible has happened to Job, then Job must have done something terrible. And if he will repent, then everything will work well again. Todd said, They are dead wrong. They don't know the mind of their dog, much less the unsearchable wisdom in the mind of an awesome and loving God. Job responds powerfully to each one. That isn't the way the world works. I have seen bad people blessed and good people have trouble. God doesn't work that way. Something else is going on. Eventually, the friends cannot answer. They will wait until God demands their repentance. And then Todd shared some do's and don'ts for helping those who are grieving. And I think this may indeed greatly bless all of us. Again, this is from a father who was grieving deeply over the loss of his son. Number one, he said, do give the gift of undemanding presence. Just be there. No expectations. He said, I will never be able to express what it meant for people to be there with us. And this is me saying this, and I probably said it before. But folks, you need to go to funerals when you can. You need to go to the visitations. You need to be there. I know sometimes I've heard people say, well, but I don't really know the person who died. No, maybe not, but you know the person that's there because of that, and sometimes you just need to be there. I've been at funerals before where there were very few people there. Can you imagine how a family feels when hardly anybody showed up to show their love and care? I know we all have busy lives. 
but look for opportunities to be there when people are going through very difficult times. Number two, Todd says, do weep with those who are weeping. Romans 12, 15 says, rejoice with the rejoicing, mourn with the mourning. It doesn't make it hurt more. It helps with the loneliness. Suffering is lonely. When we weep together or you weep for me when I can't, it helps. Remember what they said about Jesus when he cried at Lazarus' tomb. See how he loved him. When you cry, it is telling us you love us. Number three, do sensitively engage with my pain. Gently wade into it with me. It's okay to ask questions. Be sensitive to whether I want to talk or not. Assume I do. Ask specific questions. What do you miss most about Connor? Or where does it hurt? Or what are you worried about right now? He said questions like these are better than how are you doing? Be sensitive, he says, but also be open to non-answers. Then don't. Don't give unrequested advice or answer unasked questions or explain while all this is happening. Have enough humility to acknowledge that you don't know. I believe there is a purpose. I also believe that no human being knows what it is. Number two, don't try to pull me away from my sadness. I call it rejoicing with those who mourn. I think the times that have been the most difficult with others has been when I felt sad and someone tried to bring me out of it. And then number three, don't avoid the subject. He said, I spent an hour and a half with a good friend a couple of weeks ago, and he didn't even mention the heartbreak we were experiencing. And he said that was frustrating. Now returning to the story of Job. Number four, God meets Job Turn to Job chapter 38. In chapters 38 through 41, Job turns to God and says, I want an answer. I want to stand before God and make my case. I want God to tell me what's going on. In the end, Job didn't really need answers. He needed an encounter with the living God. Look at Job 38, starting in verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins like a man, and I will ask you, and you instruct me. I kind of think that Job, as you go through like the whole story, the whole book, as he's arguing with his friends, you know, they're saying you're, you're suffering because you're a terrible sinner, and he's saying, you know, no, I'm not, and I think... He's kind of defended that so much that Job's kind of gotten maybe a little bit uppity about himself even. And God needs to kind of put Job back in his place. And so God speaks to Job and says, tell me just how great you are here compared to God. Gird up your loins like a man and I will ask you and you instruct me. Verse 4, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements since you know? Or who stretched the line on it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who enclosed the sea with doors? When bursting forth, it went out from the womb. When I made a cloud its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band. And I placed boundaries on it. And I set a bolt and doors. And I said, thus far you shall come, but no farther. And here shall your proud ways stop. 
In other words, poor little Job, how would the universe run if you were in charge? You're questioning God. God did something he shouldn't have done. You don't really understand what you're saying. And I think it's about this point that Job then wisely puts his hand over his mouth and says, I don't understand any of that. I will be quiet now. God revealed to Job his strength and wisdom, and Job just fell to the ground and worshipped. He won't ask any more questions. He will just trust. I think one of the main points of the story of Job is that it was only through his extreme grief and pain that Job could come face to face with the living God. And perhaps that was worth more than anything else he could have done. Do you remember how the story of Job ends? In chapter 42, Job ends up getting it all back. Look at Job 42, verse 10. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends, and the Lord increased all that Job had twofold. The writer lets us know here it all works out in the end. Job holds on to God, and God continues to bless Job. In the end, it all works out right. God helps Job overcome his grief as well as his friends and family that gather around to support him. You and I are going to experience grief in this world, but we can overcome that grief with God's help. Let me close with two last things that my cousin Todd shared at the end of that sermon. Two things he said that he was thankful for as he walked in the valley of the shadow of death. First, he said, I am thankful I built my life on a foundation of faith before the storm hit. Jesus tells the story about the wise man and the foolish man. He says the wise man builds his life on the teaching of Jesus. He puts them into practice. The foolish man treats Jesus as interesting or irrelevant. And so he builds his life on something else. Storms hit both men's houses. I am thankful that May 28 wasn't the first time I had wrestled with the sovereignty of God or deeper questions of faith. Storms are coming. I wasn't fully prepared for it. They caught me by surprise, but the foundation has held. He said there was a moment on the highway before anyone else got there to help us. When I got on my knees and said, okay, God, if this is where you are taking us, we will go with you. He said, it was not the first time I bowed my knee to God as my king. That issue had been settled for a long time, no matter what. Jesus is the Lord of my life. And then number two, he said, I am thankful for years of investing in the body of Christ. The church, he said, mostly this church has been my life for as long as I can remember. When we need it most, the church has held us and given us far more than we have ever given. I never lost sight of the love of God because our brothers and sisters in the kingdom kept showing it to me. I am so glad that we have made this body a regular part of our life. You have held us. You are life for us. 1 Peter 5 and verse 7 says, Cast all your cares, all your anxieties, all your worries upon God because he cares about you. He really does. And he can help. He can help you get through whatever is troubling you. 
There's not a sorrow or a grief or a situation so terrible that the Lord cannot fix and help you overcome. So talk to God. Talk to your family. Talk to your church family. And together, we can help each other make it through that valley, the shadow of death. We can help any way that's